Ball number one. This is the cups and balls, the oldest magic trick in the world, with origins dating back to ancient Egypt. This is a painting in Beni Hassan depicting early magicians performing the trick. The cups and balls was the primary trick to test a magician's skills, and with its obvious popularity among magicians and audiences alike, it's no secret why it's still one of the most performed routines in magic. The control of attention is essentially what magic is, and cups and balls is the bread and butter of attention control. Once the magician has control, they can manipulate attention at will and alter perception, creating blindness not of vision, but rather of perception. There is an interesting parallel between magicians and the mind. Like a magician, the mind is constantly playing a trick on us, drawing our attention one way, altering our perception the other, creating and bending our cognitive tunnels at its will. We're both magician and audience members simultaneously, ever present to a constant magic trick. A magic trick whose grand finale is, perhaps, the ultimate illusion. But as is any good trick, it consists of three parts, or acts. If you imagine attention as cognitive currency, we all have a set budget. Some have larger budgets and some smaller. What we do with that currency, how we divvy our budgets, can determine a lot of things, and magicians know this. They're like brokers borrowing our attention in hopes of altering our perception. In this market of attention, the mind too has stakes. Working like a magician to get a hold of our attention, the mind works tirelessly from stimuli to stimuli, perceiving them as they present themselves. Thus, magician and mind are partners in magic. This is why Cups and Balls is so successful. The magician calls it misdirection, the mind calls it selective attention. The capacity to process certain stimuli selectively when others occur simultaneously. And the crazy thing is, the magic isn't happening here, it's happening here. The mind is tricking you, the magician is simply providing the stimulus, in this case, the balls, which are mere attention grabbers, misdirection. With this new stimulus, the mind kicks in selective attention, altering our perception, creating a cognitive tunnel honed in, in this case, the ball in hand. And if you didn't know how this trick is done, you would have missed the magician dump a ball under the cup. The partnership between the magician and the mind is a one-sided affair favoring the mind over its counterpart. You cannot have magic without the mind, and just as magic begins with attention, the mind's grand illusion does so too. Magic happens in the mind. The world, like the magician, simply provides the mind with misdirection, however subtle or not. Did you catch it? The hidden message? Here, you watch it again. Look on the left side of the screen. If you didn't catch the message the first time, you experienced perceptual blindness. Your eyes saw it, you just didn't perceive it. I provided the stimulus, the object of the picture is strategically located only on the right. The mind pulled your attention that way, creating a cognitive tunnel, making the message appear to disappear. This skill the mind has to pull our attention one way over the other has been developing over the course of millions of years of evolution, designed to keep us alive and cognizant of our surroundings. After all, it's better to pay attention to the tiger rather than the chirping bird in the forest. I think this ability the mind has now faces a more complex and ambiguous modern world, what with the internet and the busy lives we lead in comparison to our ancestors. The consequences of the misdirection back then were way more concrete. Get food or starve. Defend your village or be killed. Be aware of the pack of wolves around the village or be eaten. Now the mind has to pull our attention to either watching another episode of a show or working out. Read another article or write our own. Focus on certain aspects of our lives while completely ignoring others. The ambiguity of the consequence of the modern world's misdirection can be to one's benefit or detriment. It, of course, depends on situation to situation, person to person, but most importantly, mind to mind. But when something truly sticks and really grabs your attention, cognitive tunnels start to form. The mind's second act begins. One of his greatest escapes ever, in fact, Houdini himself referred to it as the best escape I have ever invented, the milk can escape was something audiences had never seen before. The right blend of Houdini's skill and showmanship mixed with the audience's complete and undivided attention, 
made for a nail-biting experience. The Mind's second act is all about furthering the formation of the cognitive tunnel, utilizing what I think is the secret to Houdini's success, his promotion, specifically at the bare bones, expectations. Excluding royalty and a few politicians, Houdini was the most famous man on earth at the peak of his career, a man whose reputation most definitely preceded him for the better. Before you went to a show, you already knew about his feats. You knew he stared death in the eye, only to escape unscathed. In a way, Houdini's magic started not days, weeks, or even months, but years before he stepped on stage. Houdini as an escape artist already had their attention, but as a showman, he toyed with their expectations. The formation of cognitive tunnels starts with attention, but is furthered with expectations. With the purchasing power of attention to alter perception, we can look at expectation as whether or not there will be a bull or bear market in our attention. This is to say whether, via the mind's trick of expectation, the cognitive tunnel opened up by attention will go further or if it will close. In a way, expectation is the mind using attention itself as a form of misdirection. I bet you were just looking for a message, but you didn't find anything. There was none. Your expectations altered your perception to such a degree you looked for what was non-existent. The first time I showed this example was misdirection for now, the second time. Just how audiences would see Houdini's promotional posters and implant in their minds expectations of potential failure or worse, death. Expectation goes both ways as well. Expectations towards what we choose to pay attention to and what we don't, enforcing our beliefs towards them respectively. Houdini through his escapes, his advertisement, and his reputation created expectation both towards himself and towards his competitors, which he made seem lackluster in comparison. As the audience's expectations grew and went further down the cognitive tunnel, it would gather more and more attention which would lead to more and more expectation, so on and so forth, creating a self-feeding cycle both magician and mind use alike. And it's in this very relationship, the alteration of perception first via attention, then furthered by expectation, that the magician, with the help of the mind, creates magic, and how the mind furthers the cognitive tunnel, laying the foundation for its third and final act, the Grand Illusion. Marcus Aurelius once said, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. Life, like magic, is an iceberg. We only really see the tip, what the magician shows us and what the mind allows us to perceive. While the majority lies underwater, obscured by alternating waves, much like in the entangled neurons of the brain, where, the final act, the mind's greatest illusion happens. It's said that every magic trick consists of three parts, or acts. Act 1. The mind gets a hold of our attention and guides it where it wants. The construction of a cognitive tunnel begins. Act 2. The mind uses expectation to further the construction, using it to build and guide our attention further down the tunnel. These are cognitive biases, the final piece to the mind's grand illusion. They're used by the mind to alter our perception of the objective world, forming our worldviews and mindsets, our outlooks on certain moral and ethical questions, and how we perceive and make decisions in our situations. But how are these biases created? With Act 1 and Act 2. But the mind being as efficient as it is, creates attention and expectation with cognitive biases. Magic is the control of attention, with the goal to alter perception. The magician and the mind share the same goal. The magician alters perception, however with the self-feeding cycle of attention, expectation, and cognitive biases, the mind creates perception. And then cheeky as it is, it immediately begins altering it. And if that wasn't enough, attention, expectation, and each cognitive bias are themselves susceptible to perception. This is Kostya Kimlat performing on Penn and Teller Fool Us. What Kimlat does here is, in my opinion, the best magic trick I have ever seen. A master of sleight of hand performing his art for all to see, or more appropriately, for us to not perceive. Kimlat clearly shuffles the cards back and suit side up, as seen by Penn's discomfort and Teller's rejoice in the chaos. Kimlat shuffles, Penn and Teller pick a card and place it back, and Kimlat finishes his rifle placing the deck on the table. What ensues is pure astonishment. I'm gonna 
to touch them. Oh, He's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. going to sit there. And if I let them sit there, they start to move all on their own. They start to turn over. So now every card is facing the right way. Every card is now face up. Kimlet uses no secondary deck, no dumps, no palms, just straight up sleight of hand. The magic literally happens right under pen, teller, and the audience's nose. But like our perceptions created daily within the confines of the mind. The mind creates perpetual perceptual blindness. So how do we see? How do we break the illusion and see our perceptions for what they really are? Biased. So much as we try, I fear we'll always be under the mind's illusion. When I showed the picture example in Act 1, the first time it looked like this. When I showed it again, the second time, it looked like this. If you didn't notice it, go back and see for yourself. Although this change isn't life changing or drastic, it goes to show how we all have different perceptions of our world and we deem it, to some extent, objectively true. I think there is one saving grace however. When watching a magic show, if one does not succumb to the magician's attempts at attention control, and they're able to break free from the cognitive tunnel, one can see the magician's sleight of hand. I think the same way we can spot the magician's sleight of hand, we can perceive the mind's sleight of perception. By stepping back and observing, the mind begins creating new perceptions by observing the last. But just as perception is a self-feeding cycle, if we enter a cycle of perpetual perceptual observation, we can see our biases in comparison to others that our beliefs aren't as objective as we once thought, and that our actions have more behind them than we perceive. Like the iceberg, we could see what lies under the water, behind the entangled neurons of the brain. And for a moment, before a new perception is formed, before another cognitive tunnel is created, we would see the greatest magician at work.